we find that common practice is that after speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that one needs to begin to then follow those commandments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid out and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the best of creation to implement those commandments or to show us how to live those commandments وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ In the beginning of Surah Al-Najm, the 53rd chapter of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions He does not speak of His own whims or desires. Whatever He speaks is nothing but divine intervention. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ We sent down the dhikr upon you, wa dhikr min asma al Quran. A dhikr is from amongst the names of the Qur'an لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ That it may begin to ponder and reflect over the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you may begin to explain it. The best explanation of the Qur'an is the living embodiment of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Thus we find the hadith of Bukhari when asked about his characteristics and his behavior فَقَالَتْ عَائِشَةَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهَا كَانَ خُلُقُهُ الْقُرْآنِ His characteristics and his behavior was the Qur'an. بِأَيِّ مَعْنَىٰ With the meaning of that anything inside the Qur'an which is halal, he implemented that inside his life. Anything in the Qur'an which is haram or forbidden, he avoided that. And that's before we enter into the topic of obedience, Ta'atul Rasul alayhi salatu salam, obedience towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi sallam, is important to maybe take a few steps back, maybe not just a few years, but a few centuries, to help us to understand the khalfiyah, the background of who we are supposed to be obeying. Because we find that unfortunately the masses of Muslims are very weak in their iman or very weak in their perception of the authority of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Thus you find that it becomes, excuse the expression for many of us to be trivial. And even those people are talking at the moment, you are talking in direct, going against the statements of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Thus you find in the beginning of Surah Al-Hujarat, Ya yu alladheena amanu la tarfaw raswaatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. Surah Al-Hujarat 49th chapter of the Quran, or you believe, don't raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's in works of tafsir. It mentions when a hadith and Quran are delivered or mentioned, that people continue to speak. So humbly respect or ask those people who are busy speaking in the back to lower their voices, because we are speaking verses from the Quran and the Sunnah, and not having a get together for people to entertain themselves. We've come here tonight to listen, obedience to Allah and obedience to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is the intention of coming and attending today. And as I mentioned that centuries ago, that the Prophets, they all gave an allegiance to the Quran is a mention of Surah Ali Imran, that if this messenger was to come amongst you, that you're going to aid him and give him victory, and you're going to remain true to that covenant, that promise that you've given to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And that's later on that we find that Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he made that dua, what is, what is known as da'wah to Ibrahim, the call of Ibrahim alayhi salam, he made a call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbana wa ba'ath fihim rasoolam minhum, yatlu alayhim ayatika wa yu'allimum al-kitab wa al-hikmat wa yuzakkihim. Oh Allah send amongst them one who's going to teach them the book and teach them the scripture and is going to purify them. Innaka anta al-aziz al-hakim. Indeed, the Almighty, the wise one. This is classified as the call of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He made a dua, he made a supplication. That, oh Allah, send from amongst my lineage, my progeny, from my genealogy, one who's going to make that call. Centuries later that you find that that call or that supplication of Ibrahim alayhi salam is responded. And even before that call is responded, you find Isa alayhi salam. He also made a call, he also made a supplication as well. That even as a side point, the Bible itself, it documents inside the book of Deuteronomy 18, 18, that they will come one like unto thee. Musa alayhi salam speaks about one will come like unto thee. And he's referring to none other than the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Because Isa does not resemble Musa alayhi salam. 
the most resemblance is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And Isa alayhi salam he mentioned as well inside the Quran, or describing him or speaking about him. وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ مِنَ التَّوْرَاءِ وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٌ Isa alayhi salam he gave a supplication or he gave this statement as well. There's going to come one after me, ismuhu Ahmad. His name is going to be the praiseworthy one. That was Isa alayhi salam who's waiting as well for the deliverance of the coming of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And thus we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, وَالَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْمَ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ In the beginning of Surah Al-Jum'ah that we find, وَالَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ He's the one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent amongst the illiterate individuals a messenger from amongst their own self who's going to teach him the book, teach him the scripture and he's going to purify them. And as we find amongst the most ultimate verses inside the Quran, inside Surah Al-Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُوا الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي دُلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Similar verses that we find. But in this one occasion inside Surah Al-Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Indeed, Allah conferred a great big blessing upon this Muslim Ummah. The ultimate blessing upon this Muslim Ummah is the sending of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the ultimate calamity upon this Muslim Ummah is not the bloodshed, the turmoil, the corruption, the fit and well facade we find in the face of this earth at the moment. The ultimate calamity begins with, with the death of the Prophet Sallallahu leaving this dunya. إِنَّكَ مَيِّتٌ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ You're going to have to leave this dunya and likewise everybody leave this dunya. This is the beginning of the signs of the Day of Judgment. That's the first sign of the coming of Day of Judgment that we find amongst the minor signs is when the Prophet ﷺ, he left this dunya. And thus it becomes incumbent upon us to understand how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Prophet ﷺ for us to increase in our iman in obedience towards him. When we don't understand his role, we don't understand his task, then you find obedience becomes minimal inside our lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ We raised high your remembrance. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Inside Surah Al-Qalam in the beginning we find, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Indeed, your characteristics are so sublime and manifest. One of the Andalusian Mufassirin, Ibn Juzay, he mentions, based upon his one ayah, 28 akhlaq, or 28 awsaf li rasul alayhi salatu salam. About he was 28 different characteristics about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, how special he is, or special characteristics, characteristics which have been given to him. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِدْتُمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَعُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ in the end of Surah Tawbah that we find, indeed there's come a messenger from amongst your own self. It troubles him, it harms him. It, he becomes overwhelmed. You don't come towards the path of guidance. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Prophet ﷺ in the end of Surah Tawbah. That he's a messenger from amongst your own self. It troubles him that you do not respond to his call or you do not obey the Prophet ﷺ. And likewise you find the most ultimate ayah inside the Quran, inside Surah Al-Ahzab. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهُ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهُ كَثِيرًا For you to emulate and to copy the Prophet alayhi salatu salam is the best role model. For you to emulate, to copy him inside your life, whoever believes in Allah in the last day and remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly. And thus you find that the Messenger alayhi salatu salam is not just being sent to our people, our nation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described inside Surah Al-Anbiya, the 21st chapter of the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We did not send you except for the mercy to all of mankind. Another place in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ We sent you as a warner and one who gives glad tidings to every single individual. But most of mankind fail to understand and perceive that. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, Ya ayyuhal nabi, 
inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashshiran wa nadhira wa da'iyan ila Allah bi idhnihi wa sirajan munira Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about the prophet alayhi salatu wassalam our messenger of Allah prophet of Allah we sent you to one to be a caller to give people glad tidings to warn people to call them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we've made you the blazing sun the radiant sun that people come towards the attraction of the sunnah of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam not the burning sun at this place inside the Quran as mufassirun have mentioned one who's given a radiant light that people are attracted to the light the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has touched upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam likewise we find ma kana muhammadun aba ahadin min rijalikum walakin rasulullah wa khatam an-nabiyyin the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam is not the father of any man amongst you but indeed he's the messenger of Allah and he's the seal of prophethood la nabiyya ba'di as he mentioned there's going to be no prophet that comes after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is the seal of prophethood he's the last messenger and he seals the door of prophethood and this becomes the final ummah but the blessing of this muslim ummah is that this final nation will be the first to enter into paradise and the doors of paradise will be opened by none other than the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and as he mentioned kullu ummati yadkhuluna al-jannah all of this ummah will enter into paradise except for whoever whoever refuses and his mentor he said who will refuse who will refuse to enter paradise qala man ata'ani dakhala al-jannah wa man asani faqad aba whoever obeys me goes into paradise whoever disobeys me has rejected has refused and this is how simple islam is the messenger is amongst us in the meaning that his sunnah is there most of us we know what his sunnah and his teachings are but we find that because of our lust and our desires because a shirk billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala shirk has various forms and formats the average individual they think that shirk billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala is to prostrate in front of a human being to prostrate in front of a grave to sacrifice in other name of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the ultimate shirk but there's other elements of shirk that some of us average practicing Muslims we fall into that unfortunately that shirk is ittiba ul hawa following your lust and your desires giving them preference when Umar ibn Khattab when he said to him that do you believe do you believe in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said I believe but I love my own self every human being loves their own self more that's inside Surah Al-Ahzab that you find an Nabi you awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim the Prophet is closer to you than your own selves Umar said I love my own self more the Prophet he rebuked him he said Ya Umar you haven't really believed you haven't really believed you have to love me more than your own self more than your parents more than your children and the whole of mankind Umar said that I love you more it refreshed his man. I love you more than even my own self. He said, Al-An, Ya Umar, now you reach a pinnacle level of Iman. And this is where we've fallen short. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. In some narrations going back to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, statements regarding himself, making a statement, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected, looked at the hearts of all of mankind, and selected that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam is going to be the final messenger. Then he looked at the hearts of the rest of mankind. He selected that those men and women are going to be around him. Then he looked at the whole of the earth and he selected that the final place of revelation will be Mecca. That will be the final point of revelation. Mathabat al nas made it as a returning point for mankind, a natural love which is placed inside the heart of mankind whenever. Whoever enters into the precinct, Al Haram al Makki, Kana Amina in a state of peace and tranquility everything has been selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it's not trivial that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just selected certain individuals to be with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to support him and to support his message but yet he gave us this favor that we towards the end of the time could be with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's inside the Quran inside Surah Al-Hashr that we find wama atakum ar-rasul fa khudhuhu wama nahakum anhu fantahu whatever the messenger tells you to take take it whatever it tells you to stay away stay away from it this is where ittiba ul hawa comes following one's lust and desires 
Day in and day out, we find people say, I know it's sunnah. I know I should do this. But this and that and for this reason. You know, even the side point, you read the tafsir of this ayah. Surah Al-Hashr, the 59th chapter, verse number 7 or so. Pick up tafsir of Ibn Kathir, and especially towards our respected sisters, read the tafsir of these verses. Because a famous Chinese proverb that we find, may you live in strange times. And that's exactly what we're living in at the moment. You believe in part of the book and reject another part of the book. We like to pick and choose those teachings which are easy for us to follow inside our lives. In this tafsir, this ayah, you find a woman by the name of Umm Ya'qub. That Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has cursed those women. Cursed those women who pluck their eyebrows, who place spaces inside their teeth, and who tattoo themselves, or women who tattoo other women. Umm Ya'qub said, that where is this inside the Quran? He said to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, said to her, go and read the Quran. She said, I read the Quran cover to cover, and there's no verse inside the Quran that says Allah has cursed those women who carry out such actions. Wahaqqan, there is no verse inside the Quran. There is no verse inside the Quran that says Allah has cursed women who carry out such actions. He said to her, Law qara'ti Allahi subhanahu ta'ala. If you read this verse of Allah subhanahu ta'ala, you'd find the answer. If you read the verse of Allah, وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخَضُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ Whatever he tells you to take, take it. Whatever he tells you to stay away from, stay away from it. This woman, all respected, what did she say? She said that I see your family members doing this action. Abdullah bin Mas'ud said that if you find that my wife is doing this action, then I would divorce her. Just like today that we find, people find excuses that so and so does it. This person does it, that person does it. That's not the life of a Muslim. That so and such individual does it. Because if you follow the most of the people on the face of this earth, they'll take you away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise you find another lesson for our sisters that we find the adornment, the way that they display themselves. Read the ayat inside Surah Al-Nur, the 24th chapter of the Quran. Read the ayat inside Surah Al-Ahzab, the 33rd chapter of the Quran. When verses came down of hijab, you find that a female companion who was not dressed appropriately would go to a fellow sister and, do, and cover herself with her dress. There may be two or three women who will be wearing the cloth, the abaya, covering themselves. And they said there will be nothing but darkness that can be visualized about them. There was no tight fitting, revealing clothing. They adorned themselves in an appropriate manner. That's what the Quran teaches us. And that's what the Prophet والسلام, he mentioned to the people around him the way they should adorn themselves. The reason why many of us don't carry out these actions is because of our lust and our desires. It's because what will people say? What will people think? What will people make comments about me? And even many of our brothers as well. The way that they dress, the way that they adorn themselves, the way they represent themselves. You find that brothers will say that I don't want to, for example, it may seem something trivial. I don't want to grow my beard because it may upset my wife. It might upset my mother. It may upset such and such individual. Don't you think that it would upset Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Don't you think it would upset the Prophet alayhi salatu salam? When a person came in front of him, he's clean shaven in front of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. فَأَعْرَضَ عَنْهُ He turned away from him. Turned away from him. Person had shaved his beard and a long moustache, grown moustache. And he said, pose his question, مَنْ أَمْرَكَ بِهَذَا Who ordered you to do this? He said, my Lord, my master. My master commands us to shave our beards and to leave our moustaches. The Prophet said that my master, my Lord, has commanded the men of this Muslim Ummah to grow their beards and trim their moustaches. That's what he commanded us to do. It's not a, an issue of, well, it's obedience to this. There's never any obedience to the creation if it means to disobey the Creator. Remember that day when you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't think about standing in front of people and being worried about people. Thus you find obedience of the Prophet ﷺ is paramount inside the Quran. The Quran mentions some 33, 34 occasions inside the Quran. Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. To such a degree that one place inside the Quran, inside Surah An-Nisa that we find, Whoever obeys the Messenger has obeyed Allah. It's only one place in the Quran inside Surah An-Nisa 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has flipped it around. Why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala flipped it around? To make mention of the messenger first and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after that. Because he is in a position of tashri'ah. He's in a position of making legislation by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if he commands us to do something, there's no choice. Unless he mentions a choice, unless he mentions some exception or some qara in some qarina, he says for whoever does not want to do it or is not able to do it, whoever wants to do it. A hadith will make mention of that. But if he orders us something, as ulama of usul al fiqh had mentioned, al amru yufidul wujub. Whenever he commands you to do something, you have to do it. It's not about that, maybe let me look at my own life. Let me weigh up my own life. Let me find some. That's what you find what's known as fatwa shopping. Every day in, day out. People shop around. Well, maybe you said this. Maybe Sheikh so-and-so said this. Maybe you said music is haram, but so-and-so Sheikh says it's halal. Maybe you say free mixing is haram, but so-and-so Sheikh says it's halal. Maybe you say that having a partner is haram, but so-and-so Sheikh said it's allowed to find your wife. Let that Sheikh stand on a day of judgment. All of us, Ati Rahman, Farda. All of us who stand on a day of judgment on their own. Let your own self be a judgment about your own actions. That you find some narrations, or some ulama made a critique of these narrations, but in general they're accept, acceptable. Ask your own heart. Question your own heart. When after nas, people will come and say, this is allowed, that's allowed, do this, do that inside your life. If you have any doubt, question your own heart. Your heart will tell you. Because you find that evil, sin, vice, it wavers inside the heart. It creates a feeling inside the heart. It disturbs the individual. That you find every time a person disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a disturbance begins to take place inside the life of the individual. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, وَمَنْ أَعْرَدَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَوْ مَعِيشَةً دَنْكَ وَنَحْشُرُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى قَالَ رَبِّ لِمَا حَشَرْتِنِي أَعْمَى وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا قَالَ كَذَلِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتُنَا فَنَسِيتَهَا وَكَذَلِكَ الْيَوْمَ تُنْسَى It's a surah Taha that we find وَمَنْ أَعْرَدَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي Whoever turns away from my dhikr and turns away from my dhikr and does not obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَإِنَّ لَوْ مَعِيشَةً دَنْكَ That individual will have a wretched life a difficult life This person will say in the day of judgment Why have I become blind on this day? Because you turn away from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So on this day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has turned away from you And thus you find the Prophet alayhi salatu salam He will also turn away from some of his followers when they begin to disobey him they don't want to follow the commandments of the Prophet ﷺ. in the Quran that we find يَا يُلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِيعُوا اللَّهُ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولُ وَأُولُوا الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنْ تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولُ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Oh you who believe, obey Allah and obey his messenger and those people in authority amongst you whether it be al-ulama or sultan or leaders amongst you then obey them in that which corresponds to the Quran and the Sunnah so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us time and time inside the Quran that obedience towards the Prophet sallallahu likewise we find that the most important ayah inside the Quran قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ So if you claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then make ittiba' al-rasul make ittiba' follow him inside your life because al-iman isn't about tamanni, about aspirations وَلَقَدْ صَدَقَ الشَّاعِرِ how truthful was the poet who mentioned لَوْ كَانَ حُبُّكَ صَادِقًا لَأَطَعْتُهُ إِنَّ الْمُحِبَّ لِمَنْ يُطِيعُ مُحْ if your love is true then your love has to be carried out obedience of the one that you love you love the Prophet then you carry out obedience you don't give a mere lip service that you love the Prophet or you chant about him or you sing about him or today's phenomena you sing a nasheed about him that may be some element of, of praise and salutation of the Prophet ﷺ. But life doesn't stop there. Revival of his sunnah means that every single day inside your life, you try to exert your effort to be as close as possible to the Prophet ﷺ, to be like him. That what type of personality and individual was he? What things pleased him? What aspects they upset him? This is what a Muslim used to remember inside their life towards obedience towards the Prophet ﷺ. And that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about disobedience. Whoever disobeys Allah and disobeys his messenger has gone away in the far misguided manifest path of misguidance. 
ومن يعص الله ورسوله فإن له نار جهنم خالدين فيها أبدا whoever disobeys Allah and disobeys his messenger will be placed inside the punishment of the hellfire likewise you find ومن يشاقط الرسول من بعد ما تبين الهدى ويتبع غير سبيل المؤمنين نوليه ما تولى ونصله جهنم وساءت مصيرا in such sort of nisada we find ومن يشاقط الرسول whoever contends with the messenger after guidance has been shown to that individual and follows a path other than the way of the believers then we will leave that person inside that path and that path is none other than the path of Jahannam so it's not something trivial that a person thinks that I can just disobey the Prophet and nothing will happen to me inside my life let there be a severe chastisement a wound a warning to those individuals who go against his commandments who go against the commandments of the Prophet and as he mentioned from man ragiba an sunnati falaysa minni whoever turns away from my sunnah has got nothing to do with me and that's the Prophet in this hadith that we find that three individuals they came to him or they came and they asked about his life and he thought that maybe we're not doing enough inside our lives one of the individuals he said that I'm going to pray every single night and not break my prayer another individual said I'm going to fast every single day the third individual says, I'm never going to get married inside my life. When the Prophet ﷺ heard about this, he said that I pray and I rest, and I fast and I break my fast, and I marry and I have relationship with, with, with women. فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي Whoever turns away from my sunnah has got nothing to do with me. No one can outdo or excel the Prophet ﷺ. Everybody has to follow his life to become linguistically the ideal personality. The ideal individual because he is the benchmark to follow if you place him as your benchmark then you always begin to aspire to follow him inside your life and this is where many of us have fallen short because our aspirations are not towards the Prophet that's why ulama mentioned ahmiya of seerah of reading continuously in the life of the Prophet to develop our life to be like the Prophet and thus you find that the companions if you follow their path if you look at them in great detail, you find that everything about them was emulation and imitation. You find that for some of us, it may sound trivial, it may sound something, we can't seem to perceive this. They used to sit down and defecate exactly like the Prophet Wasallam. At the Ba'd al-Athar that we find, Abdullah ibn Abbas would just squat down. He would just sit down, squat down at a location. And companions would ask him, that, why are you squatting down this manner? He said, this is a location that I saw the Prophet from a distance that he, he sat down and he carried out the call of nature. Or he would turn his riding beast around. No obstacle in front of him. They said, why did you do that? He said, because on this location I saw the Prophet turning his riding beast so I wanted to follow him. I wanted to be like the Prophet This is what these individuals were. Because in their love and their obedience, every time there was discrepancies inside their life, there's weaknesses inside their life, what was the first question they asked themselves? The first question they asked themselves, which sunnah am I missing inside my life? Not for many of us that every sunnah is destroyed, it's only sunnah. Every day we hear this statement, every day, day in and day out, it's only sunnah. It's not that important. It has no impact. That's not how the companions saw their life. They never saw that it's only, they used to, we might find it trivial to make sure that our miswak is the same type of tree, the same size, the same element. Why did the companions do that inside their life? Because they wanted to be like the Prophet And that's many of us because we don't share that love. That's why whoever comes in front of us, the role models that come in front of us, al-fusaq, rebellious, wicked individuals, whether it be the idols, the stars, the media that we find, shallow individuals we are. Whatever they display, we begin to emulate them. We begin to imitate them. We begin to take them as our role models. Is there any doubt in the Prophet Wallahi, the, the witnesses of those people who never believed in him they know him like they know their own sons I don't want to quote non-Muslims tonight but there's passages and works and there's books which have been written by non-Muslims who praise who? they praise the Prophet Michael Hart who wrote 100 most influential people on the face of this earth he was a Christian he said I tried to push Jesus to be number one I tried to push him to be number one that's what his aim was he said but when I began to study various personalities 
and I began to look at their lives, there was only one individual who fulfilled every single statement, who fulfilled every single compartment. Wahada kafir. This is a disbelieving individual. He says there's only one individual. Wahua nabi yukum, your prophet alayhi salatu salam. He fulfills every single statement. He fulfilled it. We as Muslims, we begin to walk away. We begin to travel away. You know the Prophet والسلام, how will he recognize us on the day of judgment? He will recognize us via atharul wudu. Abu Huraira, this was his own personal action as Fuqa mentioned. He would make, perform wudu to go beyond his, his arms, his elbows. He would make it to go beyond his ankles, up to his shank, up to his calf. Even his action is not sunnah. But the reason why he done it, he could shine more on the day of judgment. We find it that we don't perform wudu properly. This will shine in their judgment. We're going to be recognized by the Prophet ﷺ min athar al wudu Like a white strand on a black ox. Or a black strand on a white ox. He's going to recognize his Muslim ummah when they perform wudu properly. He's going to say to them, come, this is my ummah, this is my nation. He's going to recognize them. But if you don't fulfill his sunnah, you don't pray, you don't fast, how many people just come for yawmul jum'ah? And what is it? I fulfilled my obligation. Do you think Allah needs your obligation? This is what many of us we think. Many of us Muslims say, we think I'm doing a favor to Allah. I wear the hijab of doing a favor to Allah. I dress like a Muslim doing a favor to Allah. You think you show a favor to Allah? The favor is from Allah to you. That he guided you to Islam. Alhamdulillah. Praise be to Allah who guided us to Islam. All of us would have been juhal, ignorant individuals, would have been kalbaha'in, like animals. As you find people of Sira, they describe that at that time, the area, pre Islamic era, that we find the Arabs were in the worst state. Used to perform tawaf in a state of nudity, fornication, intoxication, adultery, all types of fawahish. He takes them out the realms of darknesses to the light. The light is all around us today. But we don't want to respond to that light anymore. That's a sad fact it is. We don't want to come towards that light. And that's in conclusion that we find that the impact of the role of the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, that we find that the Sunnah is a second element of Islamic law. Rather indeed we find ulama mentioned it is actually the first element of Islamic law. How does that fall true that the Sunnah is the first element of Islamic law? Because as I began with, We sent down the dhikr that you may explain it. The Sunnah explains the Quran. The Quran does not explain the Sunnah. So you need the Sunnah inside your life to help to understand the Quran. Secondly, we find that every Sunnah is only petty. Then what is the role of the Sunnah? Why did the Prophet ﷺ come with certain things? Why did he practice certain things? If the Sunnah is only petty, today we find that time and time again, some brothers, may Allah guide them in their zeal and their passion, all you talk about is the Sunnah. Syria is burning, Iraq is burning, Kashmir is happening there. All you're worried about is whether your beard should be this long, your thobe should be like this, your niqab should be like this, you should dress like this. This is your fallacy. This is your fallacy you've fallen into. Because according to your own belief, if you believe that Islamic law is supreme, is divine, is to be governed and to be ruled by, why can't you implement it on your 5 foot 10 inch body yourself? Why can't you implement it upon yourself? You want the world to be governed by the Sharia, but you say that the Sunnah is only trivial. It has no real impact inside your life. It's something small, it's something petty. If it's small and it's petty linguistically, why can't you adopt it inside your life? Because why? In your heart is a sickness. Is a lack of conviction and belief towards the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Likewise, you find certain individuals want to accept certain ahadith, only certain statements. Then that means you reject masses of statements of the Prophet ﷺ. Or you want to accept certain narrations from certain family members. This also means that you reject a mass portion of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And likewise, you find that some of us individuals, that we begin to just classify the Sunnah as rational that I'm only going to do anything that makes sense. This is a Western concept that many of Muslims have fallen into. If it makes sense to me, I'm going to avoid it. If it makes sense to me, I'm going to carry out inside my life. 
Islam is not based upon al aql upon, upon rationale. That if it falls into your rationale, there's certain things inside the Quran and the Sunnah that will never ever fit the rationale. So when we fall into this trap that I need to know the wisdom of why something is haram. I need to know why the wisdom, why is it dangerous? Some people say that, you know, when I do certain things inside my life, that doesn't really affect me. You, we don't look at the Sharia according to certain individuals. Allah subhanahu knows what he's created. He's the most subtle, the most aware. That's what the Sharia is based upon, not upon a personal individual. If a person speaks to a person opposite gender and their feelings are not aroused, that could be specific to them. That doesn't become Islamic law. That's not Islamic law. Islamic law talks about the masses. If a person drinks barrels of alcohol and finally gets drunk and says that now alcohol is haram. Whatever intoxicates you inside large amounts is forbidden inside small amounts. This is what the Sharia is based upon. It's based upon prevention. Preventing and curing this Muslim Ummah. It's not based upon your feelings, your rationale, what you feel is right or what is wrong. It's based upon divine intervention. Likewise, we find only taking from the Quran. Some people only want to take from the Quran. And likewise, we find overemphasizing certain things. Yes, certain things of the Sunnah are very important or we have to do them inside our life. But some people make it a benchmark that this is a person of Sunnah. And I'm only saying this, not that I may try to belittle certain people of Sunnah, but some people will say that if you move your finger in a certain way, you place your hands in a certain way, you dress in a certain way, this is a symbol of a person of Sunnah. That's not totally true. That's not totally true that you move your finger at a certain speed, that means you're a person of the Sunnah. That is not true in the Fuqaha. That's not the benchmark to judge who a person of the Sunnah is. There could be many elements, traits of the person that they have inside the Sunnah. But because qillatul ilm, a lack of knowledge, we make this the benchmark. To decipher this is a person who's implementing the Sunnah of the Prophet And that's in conclusion that we find فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُوسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْنْ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Inside these verses at Surah An-Nisa that we find فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ a neighbor, your Lord, they will never ever believe until they do not take you as a judge in the disputes that take place amongst themselves. And when you pass the judgment, O Prophet of Allah وسلم, you find that there's no ill feeling inside their hearts. They accept it totality, in total acceptance. And this is where many of us have fallen short. That we have, excuse the expression, a grudge feeling. That why is this haram? Why is this halal? Why should I do this? Why should I abstain from this? This is a sign of da'ful iman. A weakness of Iman, a lack of understanding the personality of the Prophet And thus we find in conclusion that every single action should be conforming to the best of ability to the Sunnah of the Prophet And the end do not justify the means. You know, oh, just because a person may do certain actions and they think that the end result is good. A person cannot commit haram and say at the end there's some khayr, some goodness inside that. A person throughout their life tries to do everything as close as possible to the sunnah that is a path of success that's if Imam Maliki mentioned that the sunnah is like the ark of Nuh whoever embarks that ark will be rescued every time this Muslim Ummah returns back to the sunnah the life of the Prophet they'll be rescued they'll be saved their love and their devotion may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq and ability to develop the love towards the Prophet and to develop obedience towards him to obey him to the best of our ability inside this dunya. Fattaqu Allah ma istata'tum as the Quran mentioned. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as you can. Wa qulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li jami'il muslimin fa astaghfiru innahu al-ghafur rahim.